This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Long ago, God spoke to us through creation and prophets. Long ago, God sent us the word incarnate. Let us gather to sing our praise and show our thanksgiving. Let us worship the Lord our God. The reading is Psalm 26, 1 through 12, page 103 in the Old Testament section of the Pew Bible. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with the hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with the sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty. Those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. The word of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God comes in every language that we can understand as God's children. And we thank Monica for offering her native tongue this morning on World Communion Sunday. And now in English, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and chapter 2 verses 5 through 12 can be found on page 218 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles if you would like to read along this day. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word, when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more ex excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? or mortals that you care for them. You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It's a fitting metaphor this time of year when people come out to Somerset and Hunterdon counties just to be near an actual apple tree. Tis the season for hand-picking the apples right off the tree themselves, careful not to take the ones that have already fallen. My children love to go apple picking. We've been doing it since our days in Virginia, where the terrain and horse country in many parts of the Commonwealth are akin to these parts in New Jersey. We taught them as toddlers to avoid the apples on the ground. They'd likely fall in prematurely, some already rotting. Those apples aren't people food, we'd say. They are worm food as they decompose back into the earth, finding their own resting place just near the tree that gave them life. If we human beings are like apples, then that old saying means we don't stray too far from our roots. We inherit family traits and tendencies for better or for worse. If we combine with other families through marriage, we may even point fingers as to which line resulted in the sour apples. If children do come along, pressure's on, for they are to be the reflection of the best of our family values, being kind, wise with money, working hard in school. On the flip side, we are mortified when they do something we raise them better than to do, like shouting potty words out in public or refusing to look a grown-up in the eye. If the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, then our children would be little imprints of ourselves. Yet we know that's not the reality. We may be entrusted with raising little souls for a little while, just as we may be good stewards of the world's food and resources. But everything is a God-given gift, rather than a possession we hold. What we do with these gifts is a reflection of how impressionable we can be as children of God. In Hebrews, we hear that Jesus Christ, Son of God, is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Long ago, God created the world and God spoke through the prophets to the Israelites. Then in the fullness of time, God sent us Jesus, the specific revelation of God, the very embodiment of divinity. When the word became flesh, human beings learned what love looks like. The way he lived, taught, and healed was a direct reflection of God's grace, mercy, and power. Jesus reflects God's glory like a holy mirror. When he looks upon it, he sees God. When we look upon him, we see the very face of God and what we are to show to the world. To look upon Jesus is to see all God's power, and it is to see that we are not like him yet, but that he has perfected the art of humanity so that we have an ideal for which to live. Our lives can reflect ourselves and our flawed families, and they can also reflect Christ at work within us. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things should exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Hebrews tells us that Jesus brings us to glory. He paved the way for our salvation by letting himself be bruised, trampled, and devoured by the worms of the world. In living on earth, falling from God's tree for our sake, and rising to new life that we might bloom from his vine, Jesus offers us a life of grace, mercy, and love. He reflected God the Father. He humbled himself so that God would be glorified. He suffered so that we might be glorified. If he had only lived for himself, the story would have ended in a different way. 
There's a great Greek myth about the danger of living with hubris. The ancient Greeks believed that the goddess Nemesis liked to punish prideful and overconfident people. Unlike our forgiving and redeeming God, she was vengeful and merciless. When she encountered Narcissus, a beautiful youth admired by many, she saw that he would spurn his fans because he was so obsessed with himself. So Nemesis lured Narcissus to a pool in which he could see his own reflection. Upon gazing at his own beauty, he found himself so captivating that he could not tear himself away from the exact imprint of his very being. As a result, he squandered all his days there by the pool and eventually starved to death. Have you ever wondered what people see when they look at you? I'm not talking about being well-dressed or clean-cut, but rather what kind of imprint you make upon another. Our lives can leave a mark on other people. We can make an impression. Sometimes it's negative, like when we make decisions that are self-consumed or do things without regard for another person. Other times we can make a positive impact, selflessly giving of our time and energy without expecting anything in return. I know it's not as simplistic as that, but when you take a minute to think about a good apple versus a bad one, you know how to identify them. When we are at our best, we assume Jesus' imprint. When we try to live as he modeled, then we get to be reflections of God's glory. Instead of starving to death, we rejoice in our salvation. Jesus is the exact imprint of God's very being. But instead of looking at himself, he looked upward and outward, leaving God's mark on the world in such a way that we cannot live without it. Jesus is not proud of himself or ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. He claims us as branches of the same Christian tree. He invites us to come to the table to partake of the fruit of the vine and to take on the imprint of God, even if for a moment. He offers himself to us so that we would know there is a better way to live than being obsessed with our own reflections. He says, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me, inviting us to join him and reflect the one who gives us life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.